What's up lazy dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having an awesome day. See that right there? That means we might get wet on this video, but we're gonna try to get some pumpkins planted before we get wet. We got all our spring slash early summer pumpkins right here. Our green striped kushaw, our speckled hound kabocha, and our giant ones. Some of these giant ones haven't lasted very long. That one there slap blew up on me as holler as it can be see and it made the ground there kind of wet which means some of these others might spoil wish i could move them around but i just can't it is what it is but most of the kabochas over there seem to be hanging on pretty good so we had a pretty good little pumpkin grow out in spring early summer and that's one of the warm season crops that i am going to plant again this fall just some different varieties Abram wants to sell some pumpkins and uh, I think that'll be something fun for the kids to do. So we're gonna plant one more round of pumpkin slash winter squash, some that we can eat, some that we'll just sell as decorative or kind of jack-o'-lantern pumpkins. So yesterday afternoon, Miss Brooklyn came out here and helped me get my pumpkin planting spots all situated, get it cultivated where the row's gonna be, get some of that nature safe 855 fertilizer put down get some drip tape berries so we could be ready to plant today so let me show you my planting spots talk about that for a minute and then we'll come back here and talk about the varieties we're going to be planting and why we're planting these certain varieties so this is going to be pumpkin slash winter squash spot number one this is where we had our sweet corn planted in the spring on into the summer a little bit we got that cleaned up we got this kind of patchy cover crop of buckwheat out here that we're leaving for the most part. So what we did is we just tilled two lanes here, one there and one over there, obviously. I didn't really measure out the spacing between these two rows. I just knew that if I really want to give them plenty of room to sprawl, I could only really fit two rows in this plot right here, which is about 20, 25 foot wide and 40 foot long. I left my main line, this is the same main line setup I used on my corn. My corn I had rows every three feet. So what I did was I just plugged all the holes except for two. I just put goof plugs in those holes and then used two of those holes for these two rows right here. So if the corn was three foot apart, I think these rows right here are somewhere between nine to 12 feet apart, something like that, which should give them plenty of room to sprawl so we just cultivated where you see there and we're leaving the buckwheat there for now so we're doing a bit of an experiment here with intercropping our cover crop with the pumpkin and we'll just kind of have to see how this goes and this is something a lot of people have asked me to try asked me about trying does it work and I've always been a little bit skeptical of it just because the timing of it. You got, you'd really have to time this perfectly to do it just right, at least if you're gonna do it in the summer. I'll talk about how much easier I think it would be to do this in the fall and winter grow out. So we've got buckwheat planted here. It's about two weeks along. Buckwheat usually goes to seed, starts flowering, and, and then subsequently goes to seed at about four to five weeks. And these pumpkins are gonna take three months. Ooh, there's some thunder right there. So these pumpkins are gonna take a lot longer than the buckwheat. We don't want the buckwheat going to seed because then it becomes invasive and kind of becomes a weed issue. So what are we gonna do here? Well, I'm gonna direct seed these pumpkins and it'll take them a little while, you know, a few weeks to get big enough before they start kind of crawling out of those tilled lanes and into where the buckwheat is. By that time, the buckwheat should be flowering and so what i'll do is i'll come in here and mow the buckwheat down and we can you know wheel hoe this spot try not to till it if we don't have to maybe we can just mow it down and wheel hoe it with the oscillating hoe and terminate that buckwheat there that way it's not coming back and becoming a weed issue and then our pumpkins can sprawl over the area where the buckwheat was i mentioned that this cover crop intercropping is tough to do in the summer and the one reason that it's tough is because most of all the summer cover crops I know get pretty tall. Sorghum sedan grass gets pretty tall. Millet gets pretty tall. Sun hemp gets pretty tall. Even peas get 
fairly tall, taller than something like pumpkins plants would be. And so if you intercropped any of those with pumpkins, they would eventually shade out the pumpkins. Most of those are more longer term cover crops, so they would work as far as the time span, but they're all too tall in my opinion to really intercrop with something like pumpkins or a majority of your warm season vegetable crops for that matter. The buckwheat works good intercropping, but it's so short, it's short, but it also, you know, it's done in four to six weeks or so, and most of your vegetable crops are gonna be there a lot longer than that. So you gotta figure out something to do with buckwheat before your vegetables are done producing. So that's a tough one. So considering all that, I still really haven't figured out how to intercrop cover crops into warm season vegetables. I'm still gonna do some thinking on it, and if you've got any good ideas out there, let me know. I think we could do some things maybe with like tomatoes. We could do sorghum sedan grass between our tomato rows and just kind of keep it mowed. I think there's some things we can do there, but it's certainly a little tricky. Now, if we talk about intercropping in the fall and winter gardens where we got things like broccoli, cauliflower, collards, things that are kind of short, you know, only a few feet tall, but we got cool season cover crops that don't really get that tall. Most of those are pretty short. Clover, you know, is only gonna get a couple feet tall. We've got winter rye, which usually doesn't get that tall. At least, you know, it takes a while to get that tall. So most of our cool season cover crops are gonna be about the same height as our vegetables that we're planting. So I think we can experiment and try this a lot more in the cooler season. That's not to say I'm not gonna to try to figure out some ways to play around with it in the warm season, but I think that whole intercropping system, keeping the ground covered with something so we don't even have bare spaces between the rows, I think that's gonna work a lot better in the cooler season, and I look forward to trying it there. If you have any good ideas on intercropping or if you've tried it, let me know. Another issue with all this is actually terminating the cover crop. So I haven't had good luck in the past with crimping. I've tried crimping with my lawnmower, basically lowering my deck all the way down and just running over the plot several times. And it does fold it over, but it still eventually comes back. So crimping hasn't been a, a good way for me to terminate cover crops. Usually for me, it takes either some level of cultivation or tarp being on it for several weeks. That's really the only effective way I've found to terminate them. And that can be hard to do if you've got vegetables all growing out there. I can't go, you know, till this up if I've got pumpkin vines going everywhere. So there's definitely some tricky aspects to it, but we're going to play around with it, give it a try, because I think it long term could be very beneficial for the soil and the vegetable grow outs. We just kind of got to get our timing right. So I showed you those two rows over there, and then we've got one row we're gonna put right here. This is where we had all our tomatoes. We had three rows here. Boom, 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 and then we got our peppers that we're gonna leave there. And I was gonna use this as a compost dump pad, but I'm not really gonna need any compost until, you know, a few more months, October or so. So I figured, why not throw a row of pumpkins in right here? So we just went where that tomato row was, right there and we just tilled it went up and then back down made a furrow amended the furrow and put that drip tape right back down that should give those pumpkin plants plenty of room to sprawl they have five or six feet on each side there they may try to get into my peppers a little bit we can kind of wheel hoe close to those peppers and hopefully just keep them off of those for the time being this is going to be a nice spot for a long row of pumpkins. This plot's about 60 foot long. So now let's talk about what we're going to plant. So we have three rows. Got two rows back here where the buckwheat is that are 40 foot long and got that one long 60 foot row. And I got four different varieties or types that I want to plant. And when I plant winter squash or pumpkins, lately what I try to do is I pick one representative from each of the four major species, C. pepo, C. machata, C. maxima, and C. mixta. And I do that because there's usually one or two out of those four that I do want to save some seeds from, and I don't want any cross-pollination occurring, so I just pick one from each uh, species, and we can kind of mix 
or we can plant several different varieties in the same plot as long as they're separate species. So let's start off with the C. mixta type, which is, you know, mostly Kushaw squash as far as I'm aware. And I got this variety here. Now these are in these little uh, seed bags that I use, and there's our Amazon link to those in the description below if you want to grab some of these. But this is a variety a lady in Washington sent me, my friend Kate. This is a variety called Tug River Kushaw. So it's supposed to be similar to the green striped Kushaw. Well, this is an heirloom variety. Supposedly it has a little bit of orange coloration to it or can have some orange coloration to it. And she did mention in their testing of this uh, up in Washington State that they did see some kind of native squash bug resistance on these guys. So that made me excited to try it. So we're gonna plant 20 feet, half of one of those 40 foot rows behind me. We're gonna plant 20 feet of those with these Tug River Kushaw, which is our C or Cucabrita Mixta representative. And the second one we're going to plant in that row, so the second half of that row, we're going to plant this variety I found from Johnny's, never tried it before, called Black Futsu, or Futsu, F-U-T-S-U, not really sure how to pronounce that. But it says it's a butternut winter squash, but it, it looks more like a pumpkin. And supposedly this particular variety or type is a delicacy over in Japan. It's really good taste, and the outside of it has kind of a um cloudy powdery kind of appearance to it it's not the it kind of looks like a novelty pumpkin it's not the prettiest thing out there but it looks pretty cool but supposedly they're really good tasting and uh they're supposed to be pretty productive uh, you know a good amount of fruits per plant so we're going to try that on the second part of that row and this is a c machada species so different from the c mixta or the other ones we're going to plant so the black futsu Futsu is going to be our C. Machada representative. And these usually do pretty good when grown in the fall. They C. Machada varieties tend to have a little bit of pest disease resistance kind of built into them. So they usually do pretty good even if we have a pretty late summer or kind of harsh early fall around here. And then for the second 40 foot row in that plot behind me, we're going to plant a jack o' lantern type or a C. Pepo species. And I was looking online, just looking around, found some good disease resistant hybrids, just kind of standard jack-o'-lantern pumpkins. But I found this one here, and this one is actually bred by Johnny's, and it's called Igor, I-G-O-R. And they had listed on their site that it's not Igor, it's Igor. So this makes a nice tall pumpkin. So instead of being kind of more round like a basketball, it's a tall pumpkin, it's got some real deep ribs on it, kind of looks a little spooky. Just thought it looked really, really cool. To try supposed to get 25 to 35 pounds and um, I think that'll be fun to grow and for a 40 foot row we ought to be able to make a decent amount of pumpkins so really excited about trying Mr. Igor here and then the last one we're gonna plant which is gonna be from the C maxima or cucurbita maxima species which a lot of your giant pumpkins are is this giant white pumpkin called polar bear so that 60 foot row over there where the tomatoes go we're going to plant all polar bear there and it said these things can get up to 60 pounds they've seen cases where it's, they've got up to 100 pounds i don't think i'm going to really prune them back a whole lot to try to grow a giant one we're just going to let them get as big as they get with how many ever fruits they produce there i don't want to be if he's selling pumpkins i don't want to be lugging super heavy pumpkins up there wherever he's selling them but supposedly these maintain their color really well they stay bright white and a lot of people around here like white pumpkins and they seem to sell pretty good so we're going to try some giant white pumpkins if we can get them all to average around 30 or 40 pounds or so i think we'll be doing pretty good so we've got one from each species c mixta c maxima c machada and c pepo Let's go out here. Let me get my pipe, because I still can't bend down and plant seeds. But let me get my planting pipe, and we'll get after it. Now, the last time I used this pipe to plant some okra seeds on the video, a lot of you guys had some real good suggestions about putting a funnel here, having a little side satchel to carry your seeds. And I had intended to make all those modifications, but I kind of forgot, and we're about to get wet. So I'm going to go ahead and get these things planted. Now, if I was just relying on this drip irrigation to germinate these seeds, I would turn the tape on, see where the emitters are, and put a seed or two on top of each emitter. 
But since it's going to rain tonight and probably tomorrow too, we don't need the drip irrigation to germinate the seeds. They'll germinate with this rain and we don't need to really worry about where the emitters are as much. So what I'm going to do is come drop a seed about every foot. I'm not going to measure it out, but about every foot just so we get a good stand. And then we'll thin them out to once every one plant every two foot or so uh, once they get up and going and get germinated. So let's get these in the ground before we get wet. All right, we got those two rows planted over there. Now for this long row of white pumpkins. Y'all see that back there? I gotta hurry. Well, we ain't got wet yet. Now, I will mention in this plot behind me here, I am kind of breaking my rotation rules a little bit. We grew South Anna butternut, not this spring, but last spring in this plot. And I usually like to wait for more than a year to plant pumpkins or winter squash back in the same plot. But this was really the only good space I had open. There's been a lot of compost addition grown in here, cover crops grown in here, tomatoes grown in here since we planted those. So maybe it'll be okay. These polar bear pumpkin seeds are a little pricey. I think there was only like 10 seeds per pack from the standard packaging. But I think I got 100 seeds for like 25 bucks or something like that. And these giant white pumpkins, I've seen this thing sell for like 20, 25 bucks a piece. So we sell one pumpkin, I've recouped my seed costs and the rest of it, we're just having fun with the kids. Now my pest and disease pressure is definitely gonna be a lot higher than it was growing these pumpkins and winter squash, the ones we grew in spring and early summer. Gonna have to deal with downy mildew, powdery mildew, especially if this rain keeps up, probably some squash bug pressure. Now, for the pumpkins that are not really edible pumpkins, the giant white ones and the Igor jack-o'-lantern types, I'm not gonna plan on doing this, but I'm not opposed to using some liquid seven I have on those since we're not eating those anyway. I won't use that on the ones we're gonna eat, the butternut, the black futsu, and the tug river. I won't use it on those, but on these jack-o'-lanterns, if I have to, last resort, I will use some seven on those to zap some squash bugs if they get really bad. As far as uh, disease control stuff, probably gonna have to spray some liquid copper once a week when I can, when it's not raining, because powdery mildew, downy mildew is gonna be worse. Ooh, it is getting really cool out here right now. I can tell that storm's rolling in. But anyway, so we're gonna have to be a little bit pro, more proactive about our insect and disease control than we were in the spring, but hopefully we can stay on top of it. And I don't expect a bumper harvest here, but we're just having fun with the kids. Hopefully we get some nice pumpkins, a few nice pumpkins, and they can have a few to sit out there at their little stand and sell. So if you're growing any fall pumpkins out there, let me know what you're growing, what varieties, what types, all that good stuff. Or if you've got really good suggestions for pumpkins that have done well for you in the fall in a more Southern, tougher to grow climate, I'd love to hear those varieties as well. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe, ring the bell, like, and share. And we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm. Well, mm -hmm, by the beauty of your life.